Good morning, and welcome to our service this morning. It's nice to see you here in the sanctuary, and equally I welcome you if you are joining us online. Intimations are in print this morning and also available on our website, and you will see there there's advance notice from John Pears for our next Open Doors Day uh, for November, that's on Wednesday, the 6th of November, and that includes an organ recital by our organist, David Burns. But all the details are there in print, and I just have one additional intimation, and that's for our elders and congregational helpers. If you're responsible for distributing the church magazine, then October's copy is available at the church door. If you've not collected already, it will be there for you at the end of the service. Now, last week, or over the last couple of weeks, I've intimated the death of Mr. Neil McKinnon of Woodhead Avenue in Kirkintilloch. And the funeral service for Neil is here in the church, and that's tomorrow morning. Tomorrow at 10.30 here in the church, and thereafter going to Dildawi Crematorium for 11.45. And our thoughts and prayers remain with Neil's family and friends at this time. As we prepare for our worship this morning, let us turn to today's thought for prayer and let us pray. Creator God, how glorious is your name in all the earth. When we look at the sky, the moon and the stars, what are we that you should remember us? You have made us in your own image. You have appointed us guardians of creation and put all things under our care. God of the morning, God of life, we come to enjoy your company. We are here to seek your truth. In Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Whether you're here every week, visiting, watching online, back after some time away, or seeking a place to call home, welcome. It is good to see you all and to be here together. And so let us come. Let us open the door of our hearts, our minds, our church, and let the living God in as we raise our voices and worship him, he who alone is worthy of all our adoration and praise. Our opening hymn is 103, fill your hearts with joy and gladness.
Let us meet God in prayer. Let us pray. True and living God, creator Jesus Spirit, you are the source of all love and life, and it is good to gather this morning to praise you, to seek something, someone bigger than ourselves. It is good to ponder the eternal and reach for meaning and be still and wonder at the mystery that as surely as you know each star by name, so you know each one of us. And not just know us, but love us. And in that love you call us into community to ask our questions, to grow in faith, to find our place, to strive after the kingdom to turn back to you and become more and more the people you have created us to be. That alive in you, fired up for you, we might walk in your ways, know the joy of your presence and seek to make it known in our own lives. True and living God, Forgive us when we forget our need of you. Forgive us when we forget your need of us. Forgive us when we have been blind to your prodding, correcting, guiding, and indifferent, lukewarm to your calling on our lives. Lord, in the silence, hear us as we bring the sorries on our hearts and minds. True and living God, creator Jesus Spirit, you are the source of all love and life, and in your mercy and grace, we are assured that we are forgiven. Help us to receive that peace today and know it to be true. Open our hearts, minds, and spirits to hear your words anew and come and move among us, saving us from apathy and half-hearted following, that alive in you, fired up for you, we might worship you in our day-to-day -day living as you deserve. Hear these and all our prayers as we offer them in the words that Jesus taught us to say. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning. Once again, good to see you all here today. And before I start my old age talk, there's somebody here with a very special birthday. And that is Alice Pearson. And we want to say happy birthday to you, Alice. 
We hope you have a really lovely day and I think we should sing happy birthday to her. Alice, Alice's family have got a nice afternoon planned and I'm sure part of that might be some cake as well and I've been thinking about things that we like to eat in preparation for harvest next week but it suddenly dawned on me that there's maybe some things that we really like to eat and there's other things that we really don't and I've got some pictures and I wonder if when you see the picture you can either put your thumbs up or your thumbs down okay so the first picture there marmite Oh, I'm seeing mostly thumbs. What about you? You've maybe really not had Marmite too much, have you? No. Okay, well, what about the next one? Oh, there we are. Olives. What do you think? So, so. <laughs> mm, sometimes, sometimes not. Seen a lot of thumbs up for olives. Licorice. <laughs> what about you? Do you like daddy's licorice all sorts? Yes, they are. Blue cheese. Again, another mixed bag. <laughs> Black pudding. Quite a lot of thumbs there. Sprouts. <laughs> You've got all this to look forward to, Adam. <laughs> Pepperami. And the last one, tripe. <laughs> and there was one that I forgot to put on, which I, I just can't believe that people do this. Tomato ketchup on baked beans. Oh, I'll get some thumbs up, okay. <laughs> All of those things, you didn't really have to think too much about them. There was an immediate reaction either, oh yes, or absolutely, no. Hi Ailey, hi Rudy. Some of those things there, we think yes, absolutely, and we eat them all up. And some of those things, we turned up our noses and thought, Do you know what, absolutely no way. And that's certainly true for tripe. Absolutely not. Even the smell of it. Oh. But if that's true of things that we eat, then might it also be true for other things in life. And that's what we're going to be thinking about in church today, because today we come to the very last letter of the churches, the letters to the churches in Revelation. The seventh one, I can hardly believe that. And it's the church in Laodicea. And Jesus, well, he's not very happy with that church. He is fed up with them. And actually, they're making him feel quite sick. And that is because they are completely indifferent. They don't know if they love him. They don't know if they hate him or dislike him. They're just indifferent, lukewarm. And Jesus says that just won't do. Make up your mind. Are you hot or are you cold? If you're hot and you love me, then follow me. Give me your all, wholeheartedly living and show it in your life. And if you're cold and you don't want me, well, that's fine. That's your choice. But whatever you do, don't be lukewarm. Because that makes Jesus sick. Oof, strong words today. And that's what we're going to be thinking about as our service unfolds today. And one of the wonderful things about this letter is that it says that Jesus comes and he will knock on the door. Knock on the door of the church. And he wants to come in. And he wants to guide us. 
and set us on right ways when we maybe go wrong. And the second verse of our next hymn reminds us of that. So we're going to sing verses one and two of hymn 185, Come Children Join and Sing. <coughs> Our Bible reading this morning is taken from the book of Revelation, chapter 3, reading from verses 14 to 22, and it can be found in page 314 at the back of the Pew Bible. The message to Laodicea, to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, this is the message from the Amen, the faithful and true witness, who is the origin of all that God has created. I know what you have done. I know that you are neither hot nor cold. How I wish you were either one or the other. But because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am going to spit you out of my mouth. You say I am rich and well off. I have all I need. But you do not know how miserable and pitiful you are. You are poor, naked and blind. I advise you then to buy gold from me, pure gold in order to be rich. Buy also white clothing to dress yourself up and cover your shameful nakedness. Buy also some ointment to put on your eyes so that you may see. I rebuke and punish all whom I love. Be in earnest then and turn from your sins. Listen, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, 
I will come in and eat with them, and they will eat with me. To those who win the victory, I will give the right to sit beside me on my throne, just as I have been victorious and now sit by my Father on his throne. If you have ears, then listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. Amen, and may God add his blessing to this reading from his holy word. Let us now continue in our worship by singing together hymn number 583, Spirit Divine, Attend Our Prayers. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, Lord, our strength and our Saviour. Amen. Now and again, when I'm looking for hymns for a Sunday morning, I'll turn to the back of CH4. And there, quite often, there's a list of suggested hymns alongside Bible readings. But as you can imagine, there's not much there for the book of Revelation, and certainly not for the chapters and the verses that we have just heard. And so I did a Google search instead. 
I typed in suggested hymns for Revelation 3, 14 to 22, and I got more than I bargained for. I got 33 suggestions, which included these. Joyful, joyful, we kind of like thee. My hope is built on nothing much. Amazing grace, how interesting the sound. Blessed be the tie that doesn't cramp my style. Pillows of ages fluffed for me. Where he leads, I will consider following. Spirit of the living God, fall somewhere near me. And my favorite, I surrender some. What I stumbled across, of course, wasn't a real list of hymns, but some suggested for a lukewarm church. And that's what we're faced with as we come to our seventh letter. And rather than keeping the best until last, my goodness, it's the worst that remains. Even worse than the letter to Sardis, there's nothing good to say to or about the church in Laodicea. But there is hope. So let's turn together, dig a little deeper into this letter, considering the context, and unpack what the issues were and what we might learn. So just like the other letters, it begins with a word about who this message is from. And in this instance, it's from the Amen, the faithful and the true witness, who is the origin of all that God has created. In other words, this letter is from the one who is the source and the origin of all things. He wants it to be known that it is from the true and the living Lord. And he is far from happy because he knows what they have done, which in truth is not very much. I know that you are neither cold nor hot. Oh, how I wish you were either one or the other. But because you are lukewarm, I'm going to spit to you out of my mouth. The church in Laodicea has sickened Jesus. He's disgusted with them because they can't make up their minds, are they for him or not? They're completely indifferent. They are lukewarm. And we all know how disappointing that is. Quite often I'm at my desk and I'll take a sip of my tea and ah, oh, disappointing. It's been there too long and it's not quite cold, but it's no longer hot. Not good. It could be so much better. So what was happening in Laodicea? Well, some commentators reckon that the word pictures in this letter that we're just about to look at are quite common, not specific to the people here. But I have to say I was quite blown away when I started to read about the place and then returned to the letter. You see, I don't think it's an accident that the reference to lukewarm is used to describe a place where the water was terrible. It came from five or six miles away. It traveled from an aqueduct in the south of the city, likely from a hot mineral spring. And by the time it arrived in Laodicea, it was not hot or cold, it was lukewarm. Not good for drinking, no good for washing, pretty useless. These folks knew what lukewarm meant and it wasn't good. So why were things so bad? Well, it all boils down to, if you'll excuse the pun, their circumstances. To onlookers, everything was great. Laodicea enjoyed great prosperity. It was in a good location and it had lots going for it. They were one of the richest commercial centers of the ancient world, the banking center for the whole region. They were extremely well off. They had a fine medical school that specialized in ophthalmology and people would come from all around to train as doctors. 
And the local farmers, well, they bred a particular type of sheep that had beautiful, glossy black wool. And it was much sought after. As far as material prosperity, luxury, and physical health went, these folks were leading the way. Indeed, when an earthquake struck in AD 61, I've mentioned an earthquake last week, unlike other cities, Laodicea turned down financial help from Rome because they could afford to rebuild on their own. As a result of their clothing trade with a black glossy wool and their famous te fra frigia eye ointment, they were well off. They had it made. They were self-sufficient, which in and of itself isn't bad, but here's the thing. They were smug with it. We don't need anyone or anything. We can manage on our own. No, says Jesus. No, you can't. You say, I'm rich and I'm well off. I have all I need. But you don't know how miserable and pitiful you are. Laodicea had clearly rubbed off on the church and the Christians there had lost sight of what was important. They were apathetic, half-hearted, now completely indifferent to Jesus, naked, poor, spiritually blind. <coughs> They've lost sight of the message they first heard, putting their trust in things that perish rather than in the love that lasts. Sure, Laodicea, you might have lots of money, but How's your spirit? You might have fancy clothes, but can't you see you're shamefully naked? No, of course you can't. You make ointments that heal eyes, but you can't see what's going on in your own soul. Your pride has blinded you to the things that truly matter. Their preoccupation with money and material things had made them comfortable and indifferent to the gospel to the extent that they were sickening Jesus, making him, as the message translation puts it, want to vomit. And so he says to them, here's what I want you to do. Buy your gold from me, gold that's been in the refiner's fire, and then you'll be rich. Buy your clothes from me, clothes designed in heaven. You've gone around half naked long enough. And buy medicine for your eyes from me so you can see, really see. Forget the preoccupation with buying and collecting stuff. Be earnest, burn hot for me. Turn away from all that is not life-giving and come back. Let me burn away the sin and refine you. Let me cover you in baptism's promise. Let me open your eyes and show you what really matters. The things that money cannot buy. Let me lead you, shepherd you from death into life. There's all sorts of things that vie for our attention, aren't there? Not least material things. If I get or have this, I'll be secure. I'll be well off, satisfied, content. Money, wealth, in and of itself isn't a problem in the Bible. But it's all about how we choose to use it and whether or not it helps or hinders our walk with God. And there's one thing that is clear from this letter. Jesus doesn't want us to just consider following him. He doesn't want us to surrender some of ourselves. He doesn't want us to kind of like him. He wants us to make a clear decision one way or another and then stick to it. All in. Our whole selves. Living lives that show 
that truth, whether it be hot or cold. And one of the lovely things about this letter, yes, believe it or not, there is something lovely, is what is said in verses 19 and 20. Tom Wright says that it's strange that the one church that was in real trouble drew from the Lord the most intimate and loving promise. For Jesus says to them, I rebuke all whom I love. The message puts it like this. The people I love, I call to account, broad and correct and guide, so that they'll live at their best. Jesus isn't abandoning this church to their self-sufficiency and their indifference. He loves them so much that he's calling them out. He, he's telling them off that they might listen up and change their ways and hear him standing, knocking at the door. So often when we hear these words, I stand at the door and knock, we think about personal salvation. Jesus knocking at the door of our hearts and waiting for it to be open and to be accepted in. And sure, that's a message worth preaching and hearing. But when I was preparing for this week and was reflecting on those words, it was a cartoon that sprang into my mind by an artist called The Naked Pastor. This one here. Jesus on the outside of the church and the church within holding the door closed. Don't let him in. He'll change everything. In this letter, Jesus isn't talking to individuals one-on-one. -on -one. He's talking to a church. And he goes on to say something that is so important. The bits that we so often miss after those words, I stand at the door and knock. If any hear my voice and open the door, I will come into their house and eat with them, and they will eat with me. This is not a quick hello or a flying visit, a grabbing a quick sandwich together. It's a supping. It's the main meal of the day when you take time to slow down, chat, and deepen relationships. Jesus wants the church to open the door and let him in, that he might hang out with us, linger long with us, be in relationship both personally and communally, be at the very heart of the church, not on the outside, but in. And yes, changing everything that needs to be changed saving us from complacency and apathy and indifference. And the wonderful thing is that this Jesus, this true and living God, knocks on the door of the very worst church because he hasn't given up, but he leaves it entirely up to them as to whether or not they open the door to him. For God will not push his way in or go where he is not wanted, but faithfully knocks in the hope that they will open and they will say, come in and let him change everything that needs to be changed. The decision is entirely up to them. And the same is true for us. May we not leave them out in the cold, 
but hear his knocking. Welcome him in. Take on board any prodding, correcting, guiding. And allow Jesus to change and transform us. That refined, we might be saved from lukewarm living that makes him feel sick and clothed in love that we might go into the world and serve him with eyes that can see what truly matters. For Jesus doesn't want us just to consider following him. He doesn't want us to surrender some of ourselves. He doesn't want us to kind of like him. He wants us to make a clear decision, one way or another, and then stick to it, all in our whole selves, living lives that show that truth. If we have ears to hear, may we listen to the wind words, May we hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. May we hear what the Spirit is saying to us. Amen. Laodicea didn't know their need of a saviour. I hope and pray that we do. I hope and pray that we know that we need God. We need Jesus each and every day. And so, if those words are true for you, then sing it out with everything you've got as we stand and sing 556.
to offer our prayers now for others and for ourselves. And during this prayer, I'm going to leave periods of silence for you to bring your own thoughts and prayers to God. Let us pray. God, you are not indifferent to us. In Jesus, you say a resounding yes. And you stand knocking at the door, ready to be invited in, that we might know you better as you comfort the wounded, challenge the comfortable, console the grieving, and remind us that lukewarm just won't do. Thank you, God, for persisting with us. Thank you for prodding, correcting, guiding. Thank you for your unrelenting love that inspires us to be all that we can be in and for you. In that love, we come before you again. And in moments of quiet, we pray for those whom we love and think of often, praying that you would bless them and keep them in their need. We pray for those in front of us and behind us and to our right and our left. And we pray for those who used to worship alongside us, but for whatever reason do so no more. Lord, in the silence, hear us. We pray for those who are seeking meaning and purpose and those who are indifferent, who do not see or know their need of you. We bring to mind those who are sick in body, mind or spirit and those who are hurting and grieving this day.
as the sirens rush by outside. So we pray for the world, so often broken and at war with itself. We think of Israel and Gaza and Lebanon. We think of Ukraine and Russia. And we pray for peace and for your transformation to be known among the terrorized and terrorists, the oppressed and oppressors, the victims of crime and the imprisoned perpetrators, your groaning creation crying out for greening, healing, renewal and rest. And Lord, as we dedicate our offering, so we pray for ourselves. Praying that you would save us from a lukewarm existence and enable us to surrender all to you. Following the way that brings challenge to the comfortable, hope to the grieving, comfort to the hurting, mercy to the wayward, Welcome to the drifters and seekers. Open our doors and lead us out. O oh Lord, how we pray that you will give us ears to listen to our parish. That you would give us eyes to look around and see the need, the gaps, that you would give us hearts that beat in time with heaven's heartbeat and reveal to us the things in our community that break your heart. And then give us a vision. Show us how you want us to serve and connect and partner and follow. For Lord, we want to be about the work of your kingdom and we know that we cannot do it on our own. We know our need of you in all things. So fire us up. Teach us your will. Use us. Yes, each and every one of us to be bearers of your love. God, who is forever for us, hear these our prayers, for we ask them all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Friends, do remember that there's tea and coffee at the close of our service today. And please do take the intimation sheet home and read it cover to cover because there's lots on it and it is for everyone. And so to that end, Wednesday Welcome is on, as always, this coming Wednesday from 10 o'clock with a short act of worship at half past 11. And then today is the last chance to get your tickets for the Harvest Lunch next Sunday. So don't forget to do that. And of course, before our lunch, we have our Harvest All Age service. And on the front, 
and in the parishioner there is a list of items that we are looking for to support the work of Lodging House Mission and the Food Bank and beyond. At the last Presbytery meeting, Claire Herbert from Lodging House Mission stood up and she put out a plea for help because the shelves were empty. And so our harvest celebrations come at a very good and timely um, moment for Lodging House Mission. So remember next Sunday, our harvest service. And just above that, in very small print, there's notice of a family games day, which is a week on Saturday, the 19th. A date for all our diary, because we are a church family and everybody is welcome along to that. It starts at 11, finishes at two, and you can come along for the whole time or drop in. There's games and there's rolls and bacons and sausage as well. So all good. A date for your diary a week on Saturday. And last but by no means least, I think I'm right in saying that there is a fair trade stall as well after the service today, if you're wanting to buy anything from that and support the work of fair trade. But for now, we stand together and we sing hymn 465, Be Thou My Vision.
through the doors out into the world and be all in for Jesus and the blessing of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you all this day and remain with you forevermore.